Good morning. All right. There's a lot of us. <laughs> we brought the whole gang. Thanks. <laughs> All right, welcome to the Watchers on the Wall live podcast. All right, I'm so glad you can all make it. Sunday morning, 10 a.m. That's, I know, a lot to ask of you. <laughs> so I really, really do appreciate you coming out this morning. I know some of you might be hungover. You got the con crud maybe kicking in. It's a, it's a lot. So I really do appreciate you making it here this morning. So, thank you for coming. We are going to be counting down the 10 best episodes according to the Watchers on the Wall, which was, it was a quite a process. There was a bit of tussling, <laughs> a lot of tussling, <laughs> some polling, some weighting of values, and it was a bit, it was a bit. But before we jump into that, um, I'm going to go ahead, I'll introduce ourselves because there's a lot of faces up here. Uh, I'm Sue the Fury. I'm the editor-in-chief of Watchers on the Wall. <laughs> I'm Luca Nieto. I am the deputy editor for Watchers on the Wall. Came all the way from Spain. I'm David Rosenblatt. I write for Watchers on the Wall. I'm Samantha Wallace. I also write for Watchers on the Wall. I'm, going to I'm get Matt, tiring. also known as Joe Magician. I write uh, features for Watchers on the Wall. I'm also a moderator for the Song of Ice and Fire subreddit. <laughs> I'm Petra Halber. I write for Watchers on the Wall. <laughs> Vanessa Cole. I write for Watchers on the Wall and also Westworld Watchers for you Westworld fans out there. Hi, I'm Bex. I'm the unofficial beer correspondent for Watchers on the Wall. <laughs> it's totally official. She looks awesome today. Yeah. I'm Pat Spanagel. I'm one of the feature writers on uh, Watchers on the Wall. <laughs> and I'm Oz. Hi. Um, and I, I'm just, uh, I don't know, I'm kind of um, He's the sad and emotional. He's the co-owner of the website. I'm sad now. and emotional this morning because I'm a little bit hungover. <laughs> and uh, so I just want to say, like, um, this is just cool. When we started this, I don't think we ever thought or imagined that it could turn into a group of awesome contributors like we have and an awesome con where we get to meet everybody. And so I just want to say thank you all for being here. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I mean, Watchers on the Wall really is just a labor of love for us. I, I barely call it labor. It's mostly just fun for us. And so, yeah, it's been a great four years and hopefully uh, many more years to come. I mean, beyond the life of... Game of Thrones because we have the spinoff coming and we just keep on going as long as people want us to keep doing it basically so that's the plan yeah so as far as what we're doing this year we kind of just wanted to have some fun because um, if there's anything fans love doing it's just making arbitrary lists and <laughs> arguing over <laughs> So um, we'll tell you what we thought, and then at, later at the end, you can tell us what you think and tell us how wrong and stupid we are, because <laughs> that's fun, too. So um, how we determine what the best episodes were, obviously, there's a lot of diverse opinion on that. Everyone made their own top 10 lists, and then you know, I combined them all together, and then we kind of weighted it and see you know, what the correlations were and so forth. And so... You know, when, when there was some ties at the end, then we had to kind of look at those ties and determine, again, sort of almost like a re-voting to tussle at the end. So, uh, and then each one of us is going to take, take them one of those top ten and share our sort of personal feelings on that episode to give you some of our passion for it. So we're going to go ahead and dive right in, get right to it with revealing number ten all-time best episode of Game of Thrones. Take it away, David. Okay. So here's the thing. <laughs> I, uh, I put together my list, and this is number 10, which of course I'm very mad about because this was my number one. <laughs> so this was a big fight, because if you look at my bio, I say that my opinions are my personal objective truths. So I, I very much believe this is the best. So I think that the best episode, or our number 10 episode of Game of Thrones is season four finale, The Children. I think it's... Everything that, that I could want in a Game of Thrones episode and that if, if you've ever seen some of my writing or the way that I, I, I write 
about the structure of different episodes. I, I love, even though Game of Thrones is super cinematic, I love when we're reminded that it's TV and that, it, that it's, it's a bunch of overlapping stories and, and there's perhaps a central theme to it. And I think the title of The Children perfectly encompasses so many of the plot points that, that reach a culmination. And so I, I, I kind of think that, that we haven't seen season eight yet, but I think if Game of Thrones were to, were to be broken into two parts, it, it, it ends with season four, you know, one through four, and then five through eight are their, their own thing, because so many long-running plots come to an end as characters breach and go on. So I, I put together a couple things just in terms of references to the children. Um, what did I write over here? Oh, burned daughter Danny Chains. So basically, there was, uh, Danny had just freed uh, a, a, a number of slaves, and, and one of the, the farmers or, or, or sheep herders brought his, the burned charred remains of his daughter that uh, Danny's children, her dragons, had uh, burned. So she locks up uh, Rhaegal and Viserion with Drogon nowhere to be seen in that very sad scene as she's crying. Um, I wrote down, John becomes a man, uh, which later leads to his being elected. It's actually when he goes beyond the wall, intending to kill uh, Mance, but doesn't, which, as we know, leads to some people electing him, but others to be very mad. Sets him on that very specific uh, path. Uh, I wrote down, Arya uh, becomes a woman, chooses to go to Bravos. So this is, and I'll get to the fight in a second, but she leaves the Hound, presumably for dead. Uh, she has firmly, you know, she's had enough lessons from, from enough people, and she, she makes her claim, she makes her, her decision. She's going to leave him, you know, we can argue, obviously, for days about what was going through her head, but she makes that very, very firm decision in that moment, very cold-hearted, very brutally, with the Hound crying in front of her. Um, and then I wrote down, Bran becomes a tree. Uh, that is when Bran, so, so that is when Joe and Mira and so on and crew finally get uh, beyond, uh, well, well, far beyond the wall, uh, and they meet a child of the forest. So this is Arya, John, Bran, Danny, all of them reaching like very, very specific climaxes involving either them as children or, or decisions about their children. Uh, I wrote down that this was a, a scene some people might have forgotten, but this is actually the episode where Cersei uh, tells Tywin that she is, is firmly no more on Team Loras and will reject, uh, will reject that marriage and expose her children's incestuous birth to the world. So she actually puts that on the line in that episode. Uh, as we know, Tyrion kills Tywin in that episode, and uh, also Shay as well. Uh, and then lastly, um, it, the episode ends... I think gorgeously with, with that chorus of children singing the main theme, which to me is so haunting. I, I, I absolutely loved it. I geeked out about it in the, the music panel the other day. Um, but it's just incredible. So real quick, just before I go on, other things that happened in that episode. Uh, the Brienne hound fight was the best thing that I've ever seen. On, I think it's one of the most incredible things on Game of Thrones because it took something in the books that was, I think, different and made it, I don't want to say necessarily better, but adapted it to the medium. I'm a big fan of change. And it took two characters we love and or hate and or don't know what we want to feel and pitted them in an incredible fight to the death that I think is one of the best constructed scenes ever where we were all just shaking. Uh, John Barry's Egret in that episode. Kyber and Frankenstein's The Mountain Back to Life. Uh, Varys determined to leave King's Landing forever. His fate sealed. Jamie made a decision to free Tyrion, which led to his uh, father's death. And then the deaths from that episode, the final thing I'm going to say was, was a, a everyone died. Tywin, Shay, Jojen, the farmer's daughter, uh, and the hound died, you know, for all we know. So, so many things happen in that absolutely incredible episode of TV. Yeah, I mean, that really was, it is a great episode, and you're right about the, it is a super, like, tight, thematically episode. It is, like, a, sometimes uh, Game of Thrones can be a little bit, uh, it'll have a really great separate scenes, but they're not always uh, cohesive, so it, that is one of, like, a really incredibly tight, so Particularly, like, season two, three, four goes into that, like, all those paths, and they don't necessarily converge, but you find a unifying theme mm -hmm. in that season four finale that I think is gorgeous. Yeah, it is really well constructed. Okay. Moving on to number nine. Uh, Sam, take it away. So number nine, um, and I think, I actually don't remember my list, but I, I know I had this one on here, and I think I actually did have it a little bit higher. Um, so I'm with you, David. I think that everyone's bitter. <laughs> we can't always get what we want. Um, so I have Baylor, season one, episode nine, um, which I think this episode sometimes gets overshadowed by the fact that this is the episode where Ned dies. And like a, a, some what of a casual fan might only remember that part about Baylor, um, but there's so much more about that episode, 
and I think it's one of, well, let's go over it. Um, other important things that happened in that episode. Um, Catelyn ne uh, negotiates Rob's marriage to one of the Frey girls, which we know ends terribly. Um, uh, Tyrion meets Shay, um, and we learn a lot about Tyrion's kind of, we already kind of got a hint that Tyrion had like this vulnerability to him, but we really see it in that episode. Um, he, when he meets Shay and they're doing like the drinking game and everything, um, there is, the, uh, we lose Drogo and Danny, you know, goes on to lose the baby, and there's the blood magic scene um, in the Dothraki camp. Um, and we find out who Maester Aemon is, which I've always thought is such like a kind of an underrated reveal. Um, but it ends up, it's, it's so important. It just kind of, you know, blows your mind a little bit. Um, so aside from losing Ned, there are so many other important things that happen. And I mean, with any storytelling, you have to lay the groundwork the right way. You have to lay the groundwork, period. Otherwise, there is no story. Um, and I think that this episode, season one of Game of, of Game of Thrones, really had to like find its feet. I think it took a while to find its feet. And I think in this episode, this was that one episode where if you were watching the show and if you were just kind of a casual fan and you're watching, cause, oh, this is HBO's newest show. Let's see what this is all about. When episode nine happened, like they had slowly kind of been pulling us in, and then when Baylor happens, again, it's not just the shock of, of Ned losing Ned. It, that was the episode that really just kind of cemented for a lot of fans that holy shit, not only was it an amazing moment in TV, um, but this is an amazing show, and this is going to continue to be amazing, and I want to keep watching this because now I know that I can, I'm going to be surprised all the time. Um, so it's, yeah, I, I really feel like that episode just gets overshadowed by the fact that, you know, we, we lose Ned. Um, there's still a lot of points in this episode where you could conceivably ask yourself, like, what if questions, you know what I mean, before they start getting too, too kind of out there. Um, it, and something else that I thought was really interesting, I was re-watching this episode before we, um, before I left for con, and... We all know that famous line from, that Danny has in season five where she's talking about the wheel. She says, you know, Stark, Bran, uh, Baratheon, Lannister, you know, Targaryen, they're all just spokes on a wheel. And something that I never noticed until I rewatched uh, Baylor again is that when Catelyn and Walter Frey are talking, Walter Frey says something very similar. He says, Stark, Tully, Lannister, Baratheon, give me one good reason why I should waste a single thought on any of you. And it's really interesting because Danny kind of echoes the same thing a couple of seasons later, but her perspective, her saying that is completely different. She's, I want to break the wheel and I want to stop this, you know, system the way that it is. But Walter Frey talking about it, he's like, you know, Walter Frey is very much like who's in power so I can suck up to them. It doesn't kind of matter who's in power because I just want to like, you know, do what I can to, to suck up to them and, and you know, get the best for my family. Um, but I, it's just something, and maybe they don't really, they're not really that related to each other, but I just always thought it was interesting um, that you have Danny saying that a couple of seasons later and then Walter Frey saying it in, uh, in that episode. But I just, I love it. And honestly, for me, one of, one of my favorite parts, one of the best parts is that shocking moment of seeing Ned lose his head. I love Ned Stark. He was always one of my favorite characters, but you can't argue with, say what you will about shock value, I think that it was well, well employed in this episode. And like I said, it's just such an amazing episode for laying the groundwork, I think, for the rest of the seasons to follow it, so. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> okay, <laughs> steaming on to number eight, that'll be Oz. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so. Uh, for those of y'all who don't know, I, I haven't read the books, so we call that Unsullied, and I tell everybody this because you, you need to know. Uh, it's not that I don't care and I don't want to read the books, but when Sue and I started the site, uh, she made me make an, take an oath that I would not read the books until the show was over, and so I have upheld that oath. That being said, I kind of lurk. We have a communication channel and, and where we communicate everything that goes on with the sites. And I just kind of lurk and watch things from, you know, afar. And so when this came up uh, that we were going to do this, I kind of laid back and let everybody else pick, you know, which episode they wanted to cover. And then when it got down to it, Battle of the Bastards was left, which was perfect because it's really the one that I would have picked. So, um, so here we go. I, I think, I think the... You, you open it up, and Marine is under attack, Slaver's Bay, 
and there's the flaming balls of shit coming everywhere, <laughs> and the world is ending, and Tyrion says, um, despite the appearances, the city is on the rise. And <laughs> I, I, lo- I mean, I don't know, it's just something about him. I, he's, he's just the man. But, but then they also have a conversation then, because she, she gets mad. I mean, she's obviously, she's like, I'm, I'm about to just, I'm about to destroy them all. And that's when one of the times that he talks to her about not becoming her father, about killing innocent people. And so I think that was important. Um, uh, Ramsey and John meet up uh, to uh, try to work things out. Of course, John, you know, tries to end it the old way, uh, just one on one. Ramsey, um, Ramsey, of course, knows that he can't beat him, um, and he says. Uh, you know, he says, you know, John looks at him and says, well, your men want to fight for you um, when you won't fight for them. And, uh, you know, that's when Ramsey says, oh, he's good. He's good. Um, and, then, uh, and then, of course, they mention, you know, there that they haven't fed the dogs for seven days. Um, from there, we kind of move over to strategy, and they're, you know, strategizing about how this, it's him, Davos, John, Davos, uh, Tormund, uh, Sansa. And, um, I, you know, I, this is where they teach Tormund what a pincer move is. Because um, he's kind of staring at him, you know. He's like, I don't know what to tell you. Come on, I just know that I don't want to get my ass whipped. Um, but then, uh, and then they leave, and of course, that's when Sansa and John have their, you know, have their little conversation that, that doesn't go real well. And she's trying to explain to John, "Hey, you don't know this guy." And John is telling her, "Hey, I, I've fought worse than this. I've seen a lot worse than this idiot." And she's like, "Yeah, but no. I mean, the Night King." <laughs> The Night King or the White Walkers or whatever, you know, that's one thing. But this guy is manipulative and he's, you know, this is something else. Um, you know, and this, is, this was the one that came up where everybody or a lot of people were left to going, all right, so why didn't Sansa tell John that the Veil were coming, the Knights of the Veil were coming? And we could probably have an entire panel on that. Um, from there we go to, uh, John goes to see Red Velvet and um, he goes and tells her, uh, don't bring me back. And she goes, that ain't my choice. And he goes, well, yeah, it is. It's my choice. And he, she goes, no, no, no. Um, and then, of course, you know, and this is all leading up. So this is before we get to the 35 minutes of the battle. Um, Davos goes and finds the stag and realizes that, uh, you know, Shireen had been burned. And, and so that was a pretty, pretty touching moment. And, th- and that was after he and, you know, he and uh, Tormund had, you know, walked and, Tormund had told him about the, or, or Davos was telling Tormund about the demons in Stannis' head, and Tormund goes, what did the demons look like? And he goes, no, 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 like he was, like he had mental issues or something. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay. Um, and then we get to, we go back to Marine, and we've got Danny uh, and Tyrion meeting with Yara and Theon. And uh, I, I loved this because uh, the first thing that Tyrion does is he's just bashing Theon because all Theon used to do was give him hell about his height. And he, you know, he says uh, the height of nobility, or the man of your stature, or you know that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, Danny and Yara realize that they have a lot in common when they start talking about their heritage, and they're both women rulers and and um, and their fathers. Um, so it was uh, it was really good. And then we get to the battle, and I knew I know I need to move on, don't I? All right. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, I know I'm going. I'm going. It's just it's just too damn good. All right, all right, I'm going. All right, so all right, so let's just let's just start quick with this. Zigzag? <laughs> okay. I, I, I prefer serpentine, but it doesn't matter. Serpentine's on the, the, the elf thing in the, at Christmas. They do serpentine when they're trying to go save the thing. Never mind. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Ramsey sets his trap, which is exactly what Sansa was trying to get him to understand. And, of course, John falls right in there for it. Um, the, things that stu- the things that have always stood out to me is, to me, throughout the entire show, one of the most iconic stills that has ever been taken is when John is standing in the middle of the battlefield waiting on those horses to come run over him. And he's looking at me, he looks up and he goes, well, it, it's over, it's over, except it's not over. And then there's this long, continuous scene that follows John through the battlefield, kind of navigating the whole thing, which was just, I mean, y'all, listen, if you hadn't watched it in a while, go back and watch it again, because it really is. I mean, I was watching it and I'm thinking, man, I mean, this, this would be, this would be exceptional if it were a movie, and we got to sit down on a Sunday night on our couches and watch it. So, um, and of course, one one I love when he's tearing men's heads off and stuff. Um, 
and then, you know, we think John is, John is going to die then, but then John gets buried, and we know he's going to die then. He's gasping for air, and how they made that happen made it actually look like we believed he was going to die right there, even though we knew he wasn't supposed to really, <laughs> but he can't breathe, and it was just... Uh, it was just unbelievable. Knights of the Veil come in, kind of save the day. 1-1 one, one going down may have been the saddest part of it, of it all, because of that look that he gives John. And John looks up at him, you know, just with this look of respect and thanks. And then, of course, uh, we had Puppy Chow at the end. So uh, it was wonderful. So thank you. I hope I didn't go too long, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you, Oz. All right, so coming up next, number seven, which will be Mr. Patrick Spinago. All right, I'll, I'll go fast because we have to make up some time. All right, uh, I had the line in the rose was the next episode. And, of course, just like Sam said that most people think of Baylor as, well, that's the episode where Ned Stark dies, and you forget all the other things that go on. Uh, the line in the rose is his grace King Joffrey dies, and that's what everyone kind of remembers. But, Woohoo! Yeah. And, but I, so, Dead Joffrey! I, 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 so I, I was going to bring that, that sad event up. But, but then I went back and watched the episode so I could do some homework, and I was like, wow, like so many things happened. And one of the things that I enjoy about watching a Game of Thrones episode is where you have like foreshadowing, and you have like a good character interactions and unusual pairings. And, you know, and the action is good, but sometimes I like an episode that doesn't have a lot of action. And the Lion, Lion in the Rose had like so much stuff. Um, it starts off with the Boltons, not only Ram Ramsay being cruel, you know, and Reek being so sad, but, uh, but Roose Bolton returns to the North, and he explains the strategic value of Moat Kaelin and how they have to get it back. And that's like a big deal, because Moat Kaelin is almost like the wall, if you consider, you know, the Moat Kaelin has to be taken if they want to bring their forces from the South North. And it starts setting up how the North is very important, what's going to be happening in the North. Uh, and the episode kind of heralds Ramsay Bolton's, Ramsay Snow's rise, along with Joffrey's downfall. So we also get this great line where they find out that Bran and Rickon are still alive, which again is a very political, you know, act of political importance. And so uh, Ramsey says, well, maybe they went to Jon Snow. And Locke goes, who the fuck is Jon Snow? <laughs> and that's like such an important statement. It's like, who the fuck is Jon Snow? Because he's really important. And who he really is, is really important. So, so that really tickled me on, on the rewatch. Uh, Jamie starts teaming up with Braun, how they learn sword fighting. And even though you might not enjoy Jamie and Braun going into Dorne, those two characters were really fun together. And so I enjoyed how that was all introduced. Uh, Tyrion, he burns his bridges with Shay, which, you know, leads to all kinds of problems later on. Melisandre sets uh, Axel Florent on fire. You know, so we start seeing, like, a lot of, like, burnings going on with uh, the Stannis group. And then Melisandre meets up with Shireen. And, you know, that, that's enough to give you chills if you know what's going to be happening later on. Uh, Bran has his first, I think, his first weirwood vision. I mean, he's had, like, you know, visions, and he is uh, warged into to, uh, summer. But they find a weirwood tree, and he sees the tree in the far north. He sees uh, Winterfell, uh, not Winterfell, but uh, King's Landing with, like, the snow on the throne. And that connects his vision with Danny's vision. So all of a sudden, this northern storyline that is unconnected with Daenerys is suddenly connected. So, so, like, a lot of big things are happening that if you don't know what's going to be happening ahead, you'll miss, but on a rewatch, you'll really, really, you know, pick up on that. Uh, and then we get to marriage. And Joffrey marries Marjorie. And one of the best lines is when the, the Septon's doing the vows, and he says, Curse be he who would seek to tear them asunder. And the camera is framed on Olena. And, you know, and so, so it's, it's foreshadowing of Olena going to poison Joffrey, but also how this act is going to curse the Tyrell family. And she loses everything for this move. So those of you who like King Joffrey, and I know some of you are in the audience, well, this is like divine justice for Joffrey. So, <laughs> so revel in your time. But then in the reception is the most significant moment for me as a book reader. It's not Joffrey's death. It's when he has the War of the Five Kings reenacted by dwarves and that version is book authentic. So Joffrey is like a canonical book reader. So, all right, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Okay, next up for number six, Petra is going to tell us what she loves about this next episode. Uh, the door was on my personal list. I know, I know. It's... One of those episodes that hits so many emotional points in so many ways. Um, obviously, there are several character deaths. Leaf, Summer, 
Hodor. Uh, for me personally, what is most affecting about that episode, that storyline, isn't the character death, it's not Hodor's death, but it's the reveal of what happened to Willis. Um, and I think um, The Door is a really interesting example of an episode in which there can be stakes without them being life and death, and there can be consequences, uh, that consequences don't have to be fatal. Yes, Hodor dies, but the, the part of Hodor's story that haunts me is that Willis's mind, and the injustice of Willis's mind and life being stolen from him. And the fact that we learn that Bran's powers have consequences, that he can hurt people um, in ways that we weren't expecting. And I think that's a really, um, that, that, that's a really powerful thing to integrate into the show because it's famous for killing off its characters, but to introduce this idea that, well, there, there are ways that characters can suffer um, without dying is, is really important. Um, we also have, in, I, I think, the show's, um, one of the show's first attempts to, I think, rectify some of its mishandlings of trauma in previous seasons. We get that amazing scene between Sansa and Littlefinger in which she establishes, whatever you may think what happened to me continues to impact me. And we get the King's Moot in which we see Theon endorse Yara and we see that he's a changed man. And so it's an episode that certainly moves the plot forward. Uh, we get to learn how the Night King was created. Daenerys uh, commands Jorah to find the cure, Yara and Theon leave to meet Daenerys, but it's a very, it's, it's, it's an emotional episode. It's, a, it's an episode that people think of in terms of not plot progression, but in terms of emotional impact. And that's, for, for me really, when it comes down to it, that's what I look for most in the stories that I love. And The Door is an excellent example of that. Yeah, thank you, very well said. Okay, so next up is number five, which I'm going to talk about. And uh, number five is The Spoils of War, which some of you got to rewatch this weekend with the Burlington Bar crew. And uh, for this, I'm going to do a slight dramatic reenactment for you of uh, my, first, uh, my first watching. Now, understand that because of what we do at Watchers on the Wall, I was very, very spoiled on the spoils of war, which is why I always, I keep saying the spoilers of war. <laughs> but um, even being super spoiled on it, we saw all these pictures of like the, you know, the filming and this and that. I mean, I was very spoiled on it. And I still, like this is me watching the episode at home, sitting on my couch, da -da -da -da, just, you know, waiting it, you know, watching the opening scenes. There's some Danny shenanigans. It's all good, very good. And then the shit starts to go down. <laughs> And it starts to go down, and then the fire starts coming, and I literally got off my couch, and then there's an ottoman in front of my TV. And I got up and sat on the, the ottoman right in front of my TV. And by the end, I was just like, fuck. <laughs> I just sat there for a while. And I have, like, I usually do the recaps of the episode right after the episode for Watchers. And I just, I couldn't. I, it took me about two hours to even start doing it because I was so fucking hyped up. <laughs> I was, like, just running around. I was, like, tweeting. I was just, like, I just couldn't. I mean, it was too, too much. So, yeah, I mean... I know there are really smart ways of articulating how well-crafted the battle is. I think Matt Shackman did like an incredible job on it. And you know, there are people who have written very, very smart articles about it. But uh, I'm just telling you my gut reaction. It just sent that zinger right up your spine that tells you when something is really special. And uh, there's another scene in that episode that I think is also, I love, which is uh, I grew up watching a lot of movies from like the 1940s and so that were all about sort of swashbuckling, Errol, Errol Flynn, Tyrone Power. So I love a good sword play. So the Brienne and Arya sparring scene. So that's another one that's uh, it's not gonna get as much, you know, focus as of course the big fuck em up, <laughs> you know, loot train, you know, field of fire. <laughs> better name. But uh, yes, that's also another really amazing moment in that episode. So it's just such a well-crafted thing. And I think that one's, it really does stand the test of time. I mean, we've rewatched it. I've seen it several times since then. And it's, it's really just an incredible feat. You would think they're spending way, way more money than they actually are. 
And I think another thing about the episode that I appreciate on rewatch is just how great Game of Thrones is at introducing minor characters that you can care about very quickly, which they have Dick and Tarly bring him in. And I mean, it's not just because Tom Hopper is so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, God, he's just so pretty. But I mean, Dickon is just a, uh, he's just so good. You know, there's not that many very good people. So they kind of introduce him, it's of course, to make us care about him a little before they torch him. You know, but it, we have those nice little moments inter interjected there into the battle to make it a little more human. And we have, you know, of course, Bronn's path through the battle, which is so, it gives you that harrowing POV within the battle. So there's a lot going on in there that it just makes you really appreciate the craftsmanship. You know, it's not just art and inspiration. There's really intelligent craftsmanship going on. So yeah, that is why I think it damn well deserves to be high up on the list. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy my reenactments. <laughs> All right, moving on to number four is going to be Joe Magician. Yep. So number four is Blackwater. I thought this one should have been number one, like most of us do with ours. <laughs> uh, it's by far my favorite episode of Game of Thrones. Um, as a heavy book reader, when you hear that it's being adapted for a lot of your favorite show, I mean a lot of your favorite series, um, there's things going to be left out. There's going to be plot lines that are dropped, characters you're not going to see inside their heads like we do with John and Danny, which are some of the best parts of the books. But when you think about the Battle of Blackwater, that's what you sell people on. That's what you sell HBO executives on. It's the visual spectacle of it all, the way they present the battle, and just how much it means for what has been happening in the story so far. It's sort of hinted with Rob and Theon after the Battle of the Whispering Wood, where Theon's like, we did so good, we won this battle, we'll, we'll sing songs about them. And Rob's like, yeah, but we just killed 2,000 people. And you see that with the Battle of the Blackwater, when the, when the flames go up and the men are burning in the water. If you read about that kind of thing from history, that would be the sort of thing, that would be something military <laughs> geeks would lose their minds over, but we really see the personal cost of that. And even if you come into it, if you're a Lannister fan, if you're a Stannis fan, you probably have a person you want to win, but even with Stannis, when, he says, when they said, we'll lose hundreds of men storming the gate, and he says thousands, that's such a hard pill to swallow, even from a character you like. He's just going to throw people away at this battle. But more than that, I think the best parts of Blackwater are actually the uh, character moments, particularly with the Lannisters. Tyrion, very early on, gets an offer from Shay to run. Give up the Lannisters, we'll find somewhere else, we'll go through secret passages. But he chooses to stay. And he chooses to stay because Varys tells him he's the key to saving but much like the choice Jamie did to save half a million people from dying, save the sack of King's Landing part two. And he saves it, but then at the end he gets betrayed. Mandon Moore tries to kill him. And it, it's such a great moment for their family, just in the tragedy that's gonna break them down, that even in the moment when they come together where they find a, a, find a way to finally work together, it's, it's still gonna fall apart on them. And I especially love the moments with Cersei and Sansa where she brings the mercy for, quote unquote, mercy of Sir Ilan Payne into Magor's holdfast for all the ladies of the court. And then she proceeds to tell them how they're all going to die. Sanus's men are going to do horrible things to them. But don't worry, Ilan Payne will chop off your head before that happens. I'm a good queen. <laughs> I, I'm thinking very well of all. I know. <laughs> but then Sansa is running around trying to calm everybody down, singing songs. She's actually acting as the real queen of the Seven Kingdoms in that moment. And then Cersei, of course, runs off on her own with her own poison because, you know, Ilan Payne's for the rest of the commoners. <laughs> Cersei gets the, gets her own personal nice death. So, yeah, especially for book readers, I think that was just such a highlight of the show and the thing that really keeps me coming back. And um, just the way they've set the battles afterwards, copying Blackwater and the way they, they mix all it all together. It's just beautiful. I love that episode. Yeah. Damn well said it, set the standard. Okay. All right. <laughs> we ready for uh, number three with Mr. Luca Nieto. Hardhome. <laughs> I think Hardhome for me is uh, probably the main reason that I think that even though I'm not going to summarize the episode because it doesn't need to, I think it's one of those, is the main reason that season five is. Though I agree it's the most uneven season, I can't really call it the worst just because it has hard home and other reasons, but you know, it has one of the best episodes of the show. Um, b before I got here, like I, uh, because I'm a professional, I, uh, I was reading the episode summary. 
And I, uh, yeah, I think people actually, and by people I mean me, uh, people actually forget how many, how many stuff happens in the episode aside from the obvious hard home stuff. Like that's the main meeting between Daenerys and, and well, they met in the previous episode, but you know, the, the main conversation, the first conversation between Tyrion and Daenerys with the break the wheel thing that you mentioned. And uh, yeah, there's other stuff, but I don't think we have time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, Hard Home kicks ass. I mean, it just does. So, R.I.P. Carsey. Gotta love her. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna move right on to number two. Bex has a lot to say about it. <laughs> Hello, money. Um, yeah, I, I got the Reigns of Castamere episode. So, if you know me very well, um, you might be aware of uh, the Rob Starkalypse uh, <laughs> account. So, that was me. Um, so I was so pleased to to get this episode, and I, I could I could do a whole uh, panel on this. So bookmark that too next um, year. <laughs> but I, I liked it for so many reasons, and I'm mostly going to talk about the the red wedding, and then maybe zoom out if I have time. But one thing I liked is I really appreciate sort of um, sort of the technical aspects of episodes, and I thought that the way that they shot the um, the time leading up to the actual stabby stabby time of the red wedding was just really good. It was old school suspense and it was using camera angles and different shots and it also was using sort of George's narrative structure. We were kind of seeing everything through the point of view of Catelyn and I, I personally love how George does the POVs in the book so that that was really interesting to me because um, you know, the, the Red Wedding was a tragedy for many people, but as a non-Catlin hater, I would argue that it's, it's definitely a Catlin's tragedy. So I'm glad that in the show we got to sort of see through her point of view until her very last sort of guttural scream, we got to experience this through her. And um, everyone was super freaking out about the Red Wedding, but um, it's happened in real life, I think, multiple times. If you think about it, it's a really efficient way to kill a lot of people. So I'm surprised it hasn't happened more often. Um, but anyway, but, but George R. R. Martin is, is a student of history, so that's definitely what the Red Wedding reminds us of. And um, I don't know, I, wa I watch that and I, I think about the show and I think that it's technically a fantasy show, but I think it's honestly, it's kind of one of the most, most brutally honest reflections of humanity, perhaps usually at its worst on Game of Thrones. But I mean, we do these things to ourselves in real life and they put it on a show and call it fantasy and we like kind of freak out about it. Um, but it, it's, I don't know, it's about people making decisions and how those decisions affect other people and sometimes a lot of people die at once in a very gory scene, but that, that's what I like about Game of Thrones because I watch it and I feel like I'm watching something real. And so the Red Wedding, even though a lot of people thought it was very over the top, um, it's like, no, that kind of thing actually really does happen. Um, but it, it was a very emotional scene and, and kind of wrapped up the Riverland stuff. It's like, well, uh, one king down, how many more to go? <laughs> so, so, uh, so there was a certain amount of, of closure, uh, but it was the most anticipated episode for me, even with the ones that you know have come after. Um, but it also was kind of cathartic. I didn't want to see Rob die, but it was kind of cathartic in a, a way of just, uh, you know, clearing the slate of so many people to say in kind of a calculating way. But also I, I do just want to point out one, one moment in, when um, Catelyn peels back Roos's sleeve to reveal the mail. Mm. The expression on his face, I don't, I have, could put together 50 adjectives <laughs> and it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't um, be sufficient to, to really describe how you know wonderful an actor Michael is, and how much I I really admire him. Even though he like, yeah, he did some things that I don't necessarily approve of. But um, <laughs> but no. So even even sort of the quote unquote bad guys on the show are just. I mean, everyone's such a good. Okay, well, I'll argue most people on the show are pretty good actors. So um, <laughs> yeah, I think that sums it up. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's pretty great. You're right. Michael McAllen is fucking amazing. That's shit-eating shit glee, it's barely concealed, <laughs> is what I would call it. When he's like, <laughs> he's, oh, he's so happy. 
He's like, I got to kill. But yeah, I, I, I was pretty happy to see Rob die. Honestly, I was so annoyed with him at that point. <laughs> he was such an asshole. They didn't do know. right by that whole storyline. Again, we could do a, Riverla- a Riverlands panel, Sue. Bookmark that. Next um, year. We, we have so many ideas already for next year. Like, oh my God. Keep them, keep them coming, though. We love it. Okay, and for number one, we're going to pass it over to Miss Vanessa. Hey, guys. Um, just one quick comment I wanted to make about the Reigns of Casimir. If it's <laughs> not emotional enough for you, watch it with the commentary from uh, Michelle Fairley and Richard Madden. If you ever need a good cry, it's, it's perfect. I highly recommend. Um, but I have the Winds of Winter as our Ooh, number one. And number was one. my own personal pick for number one. Um, the rest of my list was really hard for me because there are so many episodes with really great moments that I love, but to find episodes that, like, the entire thing was just, you know, really had that emotional weight for me, and this was probably my, my top. I mean, so many things happen, and then it's an extra long episode, and I don't know how much stock you put in IMDb ratings, but there are only three episodes of Game of Thrones that have almost perfect 10, 9.9, and it's hard home. Reigns and, um, no, excuse me, Hard Home, Battle of the Bastards, and Winds of Winter. Um, and I, it's just, I could go on for an hour about this as well, so I'm going to try and keep it short and sweet. Um, but one of the things that really makes this such a great episode for me is the music and how it really enhances your emotions while you're watching the actors do their thing. And the actors do have a lot of great moments to play with in this episode as well. Um, Everyone just about has some really weighty, fantastic scene that they get to do. Um, It's it's just so good. And the opening with the, the church bells chiming and everyone getting ready for the trial and then the Light of the Seven starts to come in with the piano and the way they intercut the music with all of the different scenarios that are happening is just perfect. Um, And I don't know if you guys have gotten to go to the live concert experience, but that music and the, him playing the piano and the dais and the, the green comes up and it's, it's just fantastic. One of my favorite things about that piece of music is toward the end, it almost sounds like a countdown. Like, you know, something's coming. And when it happens, it's, I actually just watched it again this morning and I didn't cry <laughs> the first time I watched it, but on rewatches, I get so emotional seeing that happen. It, I mean, Cer- and Cersei's face is just so perfect with that little smile and her whine, you know. Um, but then, then you think about the tragedy of it also for her. She gets, you know, this victory over her enemies, but then she also loses her last child. And you have such mixed emotions. And I think the actors really sell it in just the perfect way. Um, Some other really great things. I mean, it's not all just weighty, emotional, heavy stuff. We do get some lighthearted moments. Um, I love when Jamie kind of insults Walter Walter Frey at their little celebration party. Um, I love Sam's face when he gets to the Citadel and he goes in the library and it's like, like, I want that library in my house. I wish I had a house big enough for that. Uh, (laughs) We get that um, great scene with um, Sansa and John on the walls of Winterfell, and we actually get to see him smile. We don't get to see that from John very often, Um, but when they're talking about, you know, winter is here, and Father always promised, it's like, oh, (laughs) it really hits you in the heart. Um, Liam Cunningham Cunningham has that great scene with um, Carrie Svenhouten when he's confronting Melisandre about what she did to Shireen, and he sells it so hard. He just got that raw emotion, and you can really feel how much he cared for her. Um, just just a fantastic scene. I love the lighthearted uh, Olena with the sand snakes <laughs> saying what we all wanted to say because we couldn't stand them. Uh, <laughs> and the, the fire and blood speech, um, Rolarian Varys, um, and then uh, Daenerys when she's planning to leave Marine, and we're all getting super excited because we were waiting forever for this to happen. Um, and she has a really nice quiet moment with Tyrion where they're talking about you know, what's going to be coming, and is she ready, and we get to see, you know, we don't get to see her be able to display a lot of emotion most of the time. She's got to be this really strong leader for her people, and to see some of that, you know, sadness and uncertainty for a change is really nice. It's it's good to see her um, get to show some range, and then just um, Tyrion's look of gratitude 
when she gives him that pen and, and calls him Hand of the Queen. I, I just love that moment. Um, and of course, you know, for book readers, we get nice little um, uh, things in there like the fray pie. <laughs> yeah. Total fan service, but that's okay. It was fun and enjoyable. Um, and then, of course, my absolute favorite part of the episode, when Bran has the vision of the Tower of Joy, and I jumped up off my couch <laughs> and applauded and cheered because, you know, if you're an R plus L equals J believer, and if you're not, I don't, what's wrong with you? <laughs> but we've been waiting um, for years and, you know, some for decades to, you know, find out that this was actually true, and we get that reveal, and it's... God, the actors are so good just conveying that like heartbreak of Ned losing his sister and then the shock of like finding the baby and then you get that cut to John's face and I literally almost cried this morning watching it um, but it was just so well done and the music was just perfect as well um, in that scene um, and then of course you get John named King of the North and that great little speech by Leanna Mormont, everyone's favorite fierce little bear. Um, and just trying to wrap up here. So um, just two more points, that nice look that Jamie gives to Cersei, kind of sowing the seeds for his final, you know, cut, cutting ties with her and leaving at the end of season seven. Thank God it finally happened. Um, but I just love that look that he gives her, like what in the world did you just do? It's fantastic. And then, of course, um, the very end of the episode is just perfect with Danny on her ships and finally heading to Westeros, um, giving us you know, something we'd been anticipating for, you know, six years. So, um, and then, of course, the music with the Greyjoy, Greyjoy and Targaryen themes blended together was just fantastic. So that's, that's why it's my yes. favorite. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Winds of Winter had by far the, for the most number one votes between us and... Um, yeah, even it, 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 it was a pretty easy choice between us. Um, we have just three minutes left, so I just wanted to hear some of your opinions. Um, the mic is set up there. If, if anyone wants to tell us we are total dumbasses or <laughs> express their own opinions or just call it out, um, we're pretty informal about this. So, yeah, anyone have their thoughts? Want to hop on up? Tell us what you think about it. So on uh, Winds of Winter, I had the theory when they announced the episode titles of like the, of the whole season, and it's like, oh, Winds of Winter is the finale. Okay, great. So at the end of the episode, any ep Game of Thrones episode, the shot ends and it goes to black. And there's like three or five seconds of black before credits roll in, and it's I, my friend and I call it the black screen of death <laughs> because we all want more, but it never comes until the next week or the next season. So I was like, okay, so it's going to go to the black screen of death, but then it's not going to go to credits. It's going to go to George R. R. Martin sitting in a study in Santa Fe, and he's just sitting there with his hat, and it's all great, and he's going to be like, the winds of winter comes out then. And I was convinced this is going to happen, and it was perfect because of the title and the book, and it didn't happen, and I was crushed. That hurts my heart. Get, get used to that feeling. You, oh, yeah. you have exceptionally beautiful, beautiful dreams. Yeah, that's, that's oh, that's gorgeous, and it hurts me deeply. Yeah, sweet summer child. Uh, <laughs> Um, when's the winner when you know when you kind of recap it it's like yeah okay number one I am surprised the door wasn't higher and I think it's not just yeah we were all crushed by the end and Hodor and the whole scene in the cave but that whole episode was such an emotional roller coaster with Sansa's you know kind of standing there and going no I don't mean my tender heart <laughs> you know I still hurt um, that I, I mean, even remember listening to the podcast after that going, I have no words. Nobody had words. We were all just sitting there stunned and numb. And so I'm surprised it wasn't higher. So that's my Yeah, it's, it's hard to decide. I mean, I think we have such wildly ranging opinions. Like there are some things that I have like in my top like five that are, you know, are not even in anyone's list or like Dave was saying his number one is wound up on number 10 and we actually had to debate our nine and ten um, there were there was sort of like a like a five-way tie and um, one of the ones that was uh, sort of surprisingly a lot of us voted for and um, it almost made my top 10 and I thought I would be like the only one to pick it was the laws of gods and men which it it's uh, notoriously has the scene with Yara and the Dreadfort I, I voted for that. Right, yeah. Yeah. That was, that was and like, everyone hates that scene because it's edited like garbage. But the rest of the episode is fucking amazing. 
it's it's this, it's this episode. It just has this one flaw, but the rest of it, it's uh, Tyrion's trial. So it's it's incredible. So I was like this close, but I was like, oh, it's it's just got this thing. But uh, so it was this close to making the top ten, but it just just had a thing. It got a thing. So um, but uh, we are. Well, let's just take one more question, and then we'll end things. How about in um, Blackwater, where Joffrey kind of has that moment where he decides who he's going to be when uh, Cersei calls him back, and he stands there and he wants to stay, and uh, Tyrion wants him to stay, and it's like, I know that probably wasn't the you know where the plot was going to go, but I mean, all I thought during that episode is, I mean, what if he stayed? Yeah. I, I, and he he ends up going back and he he get and he's like oh yeah my mother wants me back blah 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 but I mean oh man you know that in an, in an alternate uh, realm I mean I think that was a pretty important point and one one part that you didn't mention I mean the mountain and the viper they raped her murdered her and killed her children ah yeah. oh. that yes. was I voted for that I feel like Joffrey would just use human shields the whole time yeah that had like <laughs> so, several votes it just didn't quite yeah. if, if yeah. we had a top twenty it would be on it, it took it all absolutely. Us. <laughs> yeah, that would definitely be top 20. But I'm surprised, just like one final thing, I'm surprised that there was not more love for the pilot, because that was my first. That was, th was <laughs> that's one of our kind of runner-ups. It was on my list. That was pretty high up there, yeah, too. But, um, we are going to wrap it up now, so thank you all so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening, and we'll put the list on Twitter, too. So come to Watchers OT Wall Twitter, so that way you can still read the list again, and we can still argue about it, because I love it. <laughs> we have talked about doing that. So, yeah. Thank y'all so much. Run by, run by our booth in the marketplace. Thank you all so Thanks much. Have a great day.